Father, we thank you for this another opportunity to minister to these, your precious sheep. Thank you, Lord, that revelation knowledge will flow freely, uninterrupted and unhindered by any satanic or demonic force. And Father, I pray that you will speak through my vocal cords and think through my mind. None of me and all of you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Well, give the Lord a big hand clap of praise. Celebrate him for a minute here tonight. Amen. You may be seated. want to welcome you to Bible study tonight. Those of you who are streaming in, God bless you and welcome tonight. Let's jump right into this. I got a lot I want to share with you. I think it'll be a blessing to you and bring about more understanding. And we are still talking about being secure in grace. Amen. John chapter 15, St. John chapter 15, and uh, start at verse 1 and 2. St. John chapter 15, verse 1 and 2. We're going to begin to look at a little deeper into this issue of unbelief, but we're going to show you about fruit bearing and, and what, what's, what, what that's all about. Verse 1 says, I am the true vine. Now, Jesus is speaking here, and he says, I am the true vine, and my, my father is the husbandman. Now, I want you to focus in on Jesus said, I am the true vine. Verse 2 says, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now, a couple of things here. The branch, the branches, we are the branch, and every branch that's in Jesus, so, you know, Jesus is the vine, we are the branches, all right? Every branch, he says, in me that beareth not fruit. All right, now look at this phrase, he taketh away. That used to always bother me because it's like, okay, he's the vine, I'm the branch. If I don't bear fruit, he's going to take me away or basically I'm not going to be saved anymore. And there are lots of Christians who have that same understanding that if I don't bear fruit, and then we define fruit all kinds of ways, if I don't bear fruit, if I don't have increase, or if I don't bear the fruit of the Spirit, I'm not really, you know, debating on those issues. What I'm debating on or, or concerned about is he taketh away. Because I'm that branch that he's talking about, he taketh away if I don't uh, bear fruit. So, how I many you know, we absolutely need to understand what he is saying here, all right? So, look at that little, little phrase, he taketh away. And then he goes on and he says, and then he purges it that it may bring forth more fruit. Now, at a glance, this scripture seems to say that unless you bear fruit, you will be cut off from Jesus. Unless you bear fruit, you're going to be cut off from Jesus. And if we are cut off from Jesus, that means we're no longer saved. That can't be right. That just, that's just, you, you know him enough by now. You know something's not, we, we just need to dig into this. So I wanted to see that whole phrase, uh, cut off or take away and what it means. And um, <clears throat> the phrase take away or cut off, it comes from a Greek word, aro, A-I, like air, A-I-R-O, aro, which is that Greek word that's used here. And in Strong's, if you want the number Strong's, number 142, it does say to bear away. And I'm thinking, hmm. It says to bear away, it means to take away, to carry off, to lift from the ground. So I'm getting a little closer here, because right now I'm like, I'm still not getting it. To lift from the ground. Now, I started thinking about something. Context is king. Say that, context is king. So if you want to define a verse of Scripture, you got to make sure you keep up with the context, not just of that chapter, but you keep up with the context of, that, of, of, of the New Testament as well. And in Romans chapter, um, what was that? I believe it was Romans chapter 14 and 15. The message of the Bible says that, that, that the strong shall carry the weak or that the strong should bear the infirmities of the weak. That's the context there. 
It doesn't say that those who are strong shall cut off the weak. That's not what it says. So don't forget the context that's been shared here. And so basically what he's talking about, that if a person bears no fruit at all, then what we are, are understanding is that he says, I am going to bear you up. I am going to carry you. I'm going to support you. So literally what this phrase takeaway means is every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he will bear you up until you can. That's a whole lot better than he going to take you away. He, in other words, basically in modern day vernacular in this very strange uh, generation we're in, it simply means until you bear your fruit, until you can bear fruit, I got your back. That sounds like God. I'm going to lift you up. I'm going to bear you up. I'm going to bear uh, and, and, and carry you until you can bear fruit. And if a person bears no fruit, here's what, here's what the grace of God, here's what he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to take care of you. I got your back. See, once you're in me, I'm not going to let something to happen for you to get out of me. You are the branch, and if you're not bearing fruit right now, I'm going to bear you up. And so notice, I'm going to bear you up, and then he goes on to the next part, and he says, and every branch that beareth fruit, so now he's, he's dealing with people who don't bear fruit, and every branch that bears fruit, he says he's going to purge it, that it may bring forth more fruit. And I'm like, oh, Lord, how you going to purge it? Well, I believe much of this, Pruning, that's another way of saying that. Much of this pruning is to remove religion and mixtures from our lives so that the gospel of Christ can do full work through us. Remember, he's not talking about a tree. He's talking about you and me. And we're the branch, and we're in Jesus Christ. And he says, listen, even though you might be bearing some fruit, I'm going to prune you. I'm going to purge religion from you. I'm going to get rid of the mixtures in your life. You know, we're saved. Uh, we're, somebody said we're saved by grace and then turn around and say, yeah, but we got to do this in order to earn it. He says, no, I'm going to prune you from mixtures. I'm going to prune you from uh, religion. I'm going to prove you from living a life that's mixed with the law and grace. I'm going to prune and purge the law away from you, and I am going to prune and I am going to purge religion out of your life. You know the stuff we used to, use, used to live by? I'm going to get rid of all of that performance-based issue in your life, and because of that, Christ Jesus can do its full work on the inside of you, so you may be bearing some fruit, but when I get finished with you, you're going to be able to yield yourself completely to what I want to do in your life. Boy, that blessed me. That helped me out a whole lot. Amen? Now, with that in mind, let's go to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, 26. And I'm glad I checked out that word arrow because, I mean, it, it, that is it within context, especially in the book of Romans. We're going to bear the infirmities of the week, not cut you off, not throw you away. You know, if you're not doing too good, we're not going to just throw you out to church. We're going to hook you up with some people, bear you up so that you can, you know, figure out or, or be prepared to, to, to bear the fruit that you need to bear. Now, in this, I'm going to start at verse 26, and then I'm going to back way up and get the context of this. Tonight, if you don't learn anything else, please understand that you got to get context in order to get meaning. You, you know, in, 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 in defining words, we go to a definition to get meanings. But to define a verse of Scripture, you have to make sure you understand the context that that Scripture appears in so that you can get the meaning of that particular verse. All right, so now watch this. I'm sure this sounds familiar. Verse 26, for if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. How many of you have read and heard that scripture before? Basically what we have understood is that if we sin willfully or if we sin on purpose, uh, then there is no sacrifice for our sin. In other words, you can't be forgiven because you did something on purpose. 
I don't know when you have ever sinned and it wasn't on purpose. <laughs> you know, did you, did you slip and sin? No, 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 no. No, no, all sin, <laughs> all sin is, is willful. All sin is willful. I, I don't know what we tried to trick ourselves, but every sin is willful. When you cussed that lady out at the grocery store, you didn't, oops, I made a mistake and cussed her out. No, you decided willfully, I'm finna cuss her out. <laughs> All sin is willful. And, but that's not even what the issue is. If you try to dissect this without knowing the context, then you'll say, if we sin willful, if we willfully, then you'll go through your life and, and you'll start saying, okay, all right, that was a sin I made by mistake. Oh, I did that willfully. Well, you know, I, I, I kind of slipped into that one. Well, you know, I kind of plant that out. You know, the Lord's trying to tell me not to cuss out, but I did it anyway. That is, that's not what he's doing. And I know a lot of Christians that's fallen into this trap. And then here's the sad part about it. And then there remaineth no more sacrifices for your sin. Like somehow what you did caused heaven to go broke so he could not rectify or forgive you of the will for sin. I've seriously sat and, and I've heard preachers try to explain that. And I'm thinking, that ain't what it is. So back up with me and watch the beauty of context and how it, it, it gives definition to this verse 26. So I'm going to back all the way up to verse 4. All right? Verse 4 says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. So they're talking about the animal sacrifices of the old covenant uh, where they would bring bl the uh, bulls and goats and sacrificial animals and they would uh, uh, take their blood and, and the blood would only cover their sins. It would never get rid of it. The blood of animals would only cover. And you see right here, it's not possible that the blood of bulls or of goats should take away sin. It never could. It was never, ever able to take away sins. Verse 5, wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he's we're talking about Jesus, he saith, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared. So he's getting ready to show us that we're moving from animal sacrifices and there's going to be the final sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ. And then in verse 10, he says, by the which will we are sanctified, how? through the offering of what? The body of Jesus Christ, how many times? Once for all. Then verse 11, and every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifice or animal sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin, which would be his what? His body, forever sat down on the right hand of God, all right? Verse 14, for by one offering, what was that offering? His body, he has perfected forever them that are sanctified by one offering. Verse 18, now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. All right, so what have we talked about in context? The context is animal sacrifices can never take away sin. But the sacrifice of the body of Jesus can take away sin once and for all, and you never need to bring another sacrifice. This is the final sacrifice that will handle sin forever. Then we go to verse 26. Take that context with you. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth. What is the knowledge we just got? That the body of Jesus wants sacrifice takes care of sin once and for all times. So he says, now, if you willfully continue to try to bring animal sacrifices to take care of sin, after you have just heard the truth that the body of Jesus takes care of sin once and for all, here's what he says. He says, uh, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. Why? Because you don't believe in the only sacrifice for sin, the body of Jesus Christ. So, what is the definition of uh, willful sin or sinning willfully? How does a person sin willfully? Answer, by rejecting Jesus as the final 
and the only sacrifice for sin. That's what that means. To sin willfully means you are rejecting Jesus as the only sacrifice for sin. So, here's what he says. For if you willfully reject Jesus as the only sacrifice for your sins, after receiving the knowledge that the animal sacrifices don't work anymore, they can never take away sin, if you don't believe what I just told you about Jesus' body, he says, well, then there is no more sacrifice for sin cause of unbelief. You've rejected Jesus' Jesus's body as the only sacrifice for sin. If you understand that, say amen. amen. Now, let's read on down a little further. But a certain fearful looking for a judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries, he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified? You counted it an unholy thing and has done despite unto the spirit of grace. He said if, if people who despise Moses' law died without mercy under the two or three witnesses, how much more of an issue you think a person's going to have who absolutely despises and rejects the blood of Jesus and the body of its ability to take care of all of your sins? See, when you, there are people today around the world who says, I reject the body of Jesus as my sacrifice for sin. And they still trying to do as the old covenant, go and get animal sacrifice. That don't work no more. It is over, it's washed away, it is done. And here's the thing about it, it could never do it. It could never, never take care or take away your sins. It could never do it. I don't even know what the argument is. He started off here saying it could never happen. Okay? And then he, he said, here's the answer. Here's the answer for something that could never happen. The body of Jesus Christ can take away all of your sins. All right, so now what's the real issue here? The real issue here is unbelief. That's the real issue. Even deeper than rejecting the truth that Jesus' body can take away your sins, deeper than that is here's, here's sinning willfully, unbelief. Unbelief. I, I don't believe it. So Jesus is like, well, I can't do nothing because you don't believe it. Every time you make a decision to walk in unbelief where trusting God is concerned and trusting what he told you is concerned, it's a willful sin. It's the only thing that the cross of Jesus didn't deal with because it's a free moral agency issue you get to decide and choose whether you believe something or don't believe something. But if you believe it, God is ready to immediately move on behalf with everything he promised you. There is an issue of cynicism in the church world today. A cynic just can't believe that somebody can do something good and somebody can do something right. Cynicism is the greatest enemy to the grace of God. And unbelief, unbelief puts you in a position where not even God can do anything for you because everything in the kingdom operates by faith. Child of God, don't let no devil in hell get you in a position where you are questioning God and challenge you to not believe. I am a believer, amen? amen. Say it out loud. I am a believer. believer. Say it again. I am a believer. Amen. Amen. I'm a believer. I believe the Bible. I believe the table of contents. I believe the book of maps. Amen. Glory be to God. I am a believer. Amen. And I will not allow that to be taken from me. Is there everybody with me so far? Amen. So the sin of not believing in the power of the blood of Jesus, according to Hebrews 20, 26, that's a serious thing. Now, according to the context, we can see that specific sin that the specific sin 
was to renounce faith in Jesus Christ and return to the sacrifice of the old covenant. They counted the blood of Jesus as nothing special, and they returned to the sacrifices of animal blood. Can't you see the issue there? For you to say, you know, I don't believe that the blood of Jesus get the job done. I'm going to go ahead and go back to the blood of animals. You're, you're counting his blood unholy and, and, and worth nothing. And you, dis, you despite, he says, and what you have done, despite unto the spirit of grace, man, you're talking about frustrating the grace of God. That'll do it. Now, let me show you something pretty serious here. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 10, and then we'll look at 11 and 12. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10, and 11 and 12. I, um, I hope you don't feel like I'm just dumping all this on you, but, man, it's Wednesday night. You, 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 this, this, this is uh, the crew. We, we don't be playing around with the crew. It's, it's time to go. The crew say, hey, you know, let, let them loose. You get it later. Get the tape. We here. You should have kept up. <laughs> First Corinthians chapter 6, and uh, watch this. Uh, uh, let's start at verse 9. Now, I'm going to also bring to you just how this has been used in the church and how it's made people to feel condemned, and, and that's never the message of Jesus and never the message of the gospel. There's always hope because Jesus has done what he's done for us. Verse 9. Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? See, before you understood grace, you, you, that would bring fear because you're thinking, well, uh, you know, you start defining your righteousness and unrighteousness based on your behavior. And then for the most of us, we would say, well, I'm unrighteous because I hadn't been perfect. Well, you know what unrighteousness is now. Unrighteousness is a person who has not by faith accepted Jesus Christ as his righteousness. Amen? And the Bible says if you don't understand that, you are a babe and you're, you're in need of milk. You're, he says you are a babe because you are unskillful in the word of righteousness. All right, now watch this. He says, know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived. Well, I don't want to be deceived. I don't want to be deceived. Be not deceived. Oh, neither fornicators are going to inherit the kingdom of God. Idolaters. Now, idolatry is all about placing a value on something greater than God. That's basically what it is. If you place a value on something greater than God, you're in idolatry. Um, he says they won't inherit the kingdom of God. Adulterers, they won't inherit the kingdom of God. Effeminate, they won't inherit the kingdom of God. Abusers of themselves with mankind, they won't inherit the kingdom. Nor thieves, they won't inherit the kingdom. Nor covetous, nor drunkards, they won't inherit the kingdom. Nor revelers, wild parties, they won't inherit the kingdom. Extortioners, they won't inherit the kingdom. They shall inherit, uh, he says, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. They won't inherit. Now, here's the point that got me. So watch this. He said, and such were some of you. Oh, everybody here can say yes to one of them. <laughs> and such were some of you. All right, so, so far, this is looking... This ain't looking too good. What did he get ready to say? What did he get? All right, he already started with, you, you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. And then he gives a list. Ain't none of them going to inherit the kingdom of God. And then he says, and such were some of you. And ain't now one of y'all going to inherit the kingdom of God. But keep reading. And such were some of you, but you are washed. But you are sanctified. But. You are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Hallelujah. The word but means to zero out. And everything before the but is zeroed out, and the only thing that remains is what's after the but. And what's remaining after the but is that you were washed, praise God. Hallelujah. All of that stuff you might have been involved, you were washed, you are sanctified, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God. So none of that concerns you because Jesus has come in and washed you and sanctified you and justified you and declared you righteous. And somebody ought to say amen in this place. Amen. Thank God. Now, uh, uh, 
And then verse 12, this is interesting here. This, this, is, this really requires some, some attention. I, you know, well, why are we dealing with it on Wednesday night? I, I kind of switch it a little bit. I'm dealing with all of the strong, controversial stuff Wednesday night. <laughs> Wednesday night. Sunday, you know, you got a lot of folks. Sunday, you got over 100,000 people on live audience watching in. I, I, some of them might be demonically influenced. I, I don't know. They, it's less pressure <laughs> with less people. You understand what I'm saying? Got a better chance of getting it out. <laughs> Sundays, you got people. Mm, you get up and leave him. Mm. The crew, bring it on. I might not understand it right now, but I believe God. I'm going to get this. <laughs> All right, watch this now. All right, I'm, I'm going to look at verse 12 in the King James, and then we're going to look at in the. Um, we're going to look at it in the New Living Translation, and you, you'll see what I'm talking about here. He says, now, after he says all that, he says, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. I looked at that one time. I said, eh, that, that's not what I think it's saying. Uh, is, that, is that kind of say?" You can do anything you want to, but you need to be careful about making that decision because by doing that, you might find yourself a slave to something you don't want to be a slave to. All right, now, now watch this. Listen to this in the uh, NLT, same one. We, we have to, you know, I, I, we're not going to skip, uh, uh, you know, buy these things. They got to be dealt with. You got to get an answer to them. You say, I'm allowed to do anything. Now, most people stop right there. <laughs> the Bible says I can do anything I want to. See right now? And they cover up the rest of it, you know. Got to get the whole context now. You, you, you see the context of where we come from now. I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. That's when people come to me ask me questions like, well, what did the Bible say about drinking? I say, I don't know, ask me. Well, you, you telling me I can't? No, you can do whatever you want to. Because here's what I realize about human beings. At the end of the day, they do whatever they want to. I finally realized that. It took me all the years to realize all that talking, all that counseling, praying in tongues, thinking that I've really reached you, and three minutes out of my presence, you know what you do? What you want to do. So I've been saving time. I Counsel? What do we need a counsel for? What do you want to do? <laughs> well, I, I, really, I really want to smoke this, hit this joint right here and drink some of this mad dog. Well, go and do it. Because after I finish talking, that's what you're going to do anyway. There's got to be a greater motivation moving on the inside of you that holds more value than that other stuff. And that's what this is about. Finally getting you to a place where you're doing for God because you want to. And not because you feel like you're bound by some kind of legalism to do it. God wants you because you want Him. Not because you're scared you're going to go to hell or, oh my God, you've broken the law, the religious law. Oh, the religious law, you're going to hell. You've been, you, you're going to do what you want to do. Sometimes there comes a time in your life where when sin's staring you in the face, you look at it and you say, I remember, that was fun. I don't want to do it no more because I value something greater than you. I want something more than I want you now. Hmm. And then you start rejecting how many times you failed to that thing. And now you realize, look at the love I have for God. I just want him, I just want him, I want him pleased. I want him to be proud of me. I, I want him to look at me and smile at me. And then you look at that like, nah, nah, nah. and then you look again like, yeah. <laughs> Kind of like I did one time with Tap. I said, let's go down to Whole Foods. She said, why? You know, you ain't need none of that stuff. I said, let's look at it. <laughs> go by the dessert section. Let's just look at it. And she said, you know what that's going to do? I said, yeah, eventually one of us going to be tempted. Hopefully you will fall, amen? <laughs> and I can have a piece of what you fall. It don't work. He says, you say I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. 
And even though I am allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything. See, we play these little church games about what you do and what you don't do. Ain't nobody with you all the time. And at the end of the day, he says, yeah, you can do whatever you want to do. But be careful. Not all that stuff's good for you. You open up the door to something. You're starting something. You're engaged into something. You're becoming a slave to it. And his recommendation here is don't become a slave to anything. Don't become a slave to cookies. Don't become a slave. <laughs> hey, I have been set free. Free at last. Free at last. Thank God Almighty. I'm free at last. Now I got to get free from bump cake. No, I'm free from that too. I'm free. Every time I look at something, I ask myself, am I engaging into slavery with this thing? It can even happen with people. Have you become a slave to somebody giving you what you need in the comment section to make you feel good about yourself? Uh-uh. Nah. I took all that stuff off my phone. Some people say it don't bother them. Man, I'd be ready to fight. I want to find out where you live. <laughs> nah, I can't handle it. It ain't for me. You have 100,000 wonderful comments. And one, nah, I don't do social media. Well, Pastor, you on there? Yeah, but I pay somebody to run all that stuff for me. I ain't, I ain't got time to be looking for all them comments. But now I got a crew out there. Now I hear that you say something stupid about me. The crew jumped all on you to answer your question. Some of them got fake pages so they can cuss you out and not know who, who they are. I'm like, all right, now you're, gonna be, you're, coming, you're becoming a slave to cussing people out. <laughs> I am allowed to do anything, but I must not become, I must not become a slave to anything. So what are you allowing, which is going to present the potential for slavery in your life? It's been a lie for a long time in our attempt to try to present ourselves so holy, we present this, uh, this, this thing of, of phoniness. We've perfected phoniness in the body of Christ. And you, you're just phony. You're not honest. You're phony. But it's just real cool to know that you want to live right because you value that. You... you, you you, you want God. You start thinking about, look at what he's done for me. Look at how he's delivered me. Look at how he satisfied justice so he can love me without any boundaries. And you start thinking about that stuff and it's like, I know I can, I just don't want to. Wow, what an amazing, amazing witness in heaven. I know I can, but I don't want to. I don't choose to. And in some cases, you may have an urge to, and that's even better. I, the urge ain't even enough for what he's done for me. And so the love of Christ, it compels me. I can, I don't want to. That's, that's powerful, more powerful than a person that says, uh, I can't do it. That's why I'm not going to do it. You, 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 you can't do, do something that's never stopped you from doing it. I can't be selfish. And you in that circle the whole time. Let's get real. Where's your value? Hasn't God done enough? for you to value him more than all of the things that have been able to enslave you. 
I can do anything. I just choose not to do anything. Only those things that will bring pleasure to my Father. Somebody say amen. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, lift your hands up. Just worship him just for a minute. Thank you, Lord. Only what brings pleasure to you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Woo. All right, let's go to Galatians 5, 19 through 21 real quick. Galatians 5, 19 through 21. See, all this stuff is, a, is about unbelief, man. You, you have to believe that you've been washed, you've been justified, you've been cleansed. I believe that. Amen. Galatians 5, verse 19 through 21. Uh, it's kind of similar to what we read here. He says, now the works of the flesh are manifest, and here are the works of the flesh. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. Lasciviousness is, it, it literally means without restraints. In other words, one more time becomes one more time becomes one more time, and you're trying to find the breaks. It means without restraints or no restraints. <clears throat> Idolatry, witchcraft. You know, manipulation is a form of witchcraft, too. Huh? Hatred, variance, simulation, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. One day I'll go through all of these. Envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Isn't it cool that you know the end of this story here? But you've been washed. <laughs> all right. But look at verse 24. <clears throat> verse 24 says, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and the lust. Because they, they're Christ. They belong to him. Look at this in the uh, uh, New Living Translation. The New Living Translation. Verse 24 in the New Living Translation. Those who belong to Christ Jesus, I love this, have nailed the passions and the desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. I crucify them there. I don't try to, in my own ability and in my own will and with willpower, try to do that. I take those things and I nail them to the cross and they're crucified there with the cross because I'm Christ. And that cross to me is where my beginnings start. I, I like that old Baptist song that says, at the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light and the burdens of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, my God, my God, that thing will make me shout. Now I'm happy. <laughs> Hallelujah, now I'm happy. See, those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature. See, when you got born again, the old nature passed away. And with that passing away, all of those things that came from the sinful nation, nature should be nailed on that cross and should be crucified there. So this list, it's crucified. So what do you do when it tries to rear its ugly head? You remind yourself, that's crucified. I'm Christ. I belong to him now. I'm crucified. It, it's crucified. And then you go to him and you say, I live by the faith of Jesus Christ. It's no longer that, uh, that uh, it's no longer I that live, but it's, 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 he, it's Christ that lives through me. And these are the things you have to renew your mind with. Because when Satan comes in with this stuff, he's going to come right here. And he's going to take advantage of you behaving and then allowing your behavior, your bad behavior, to try to define who you are. And you, you got to stand up against that. And when those things come, ah, won't be able to do that. Why? Been nailed to the cross. It's been crucified there. The sinful nature I don't have anymore. And remind yourself, I don't, I don't carry the sinful nature anymore. It's gone. Uh, maybe next week or whenever I'm going to take you through Romans chapter 6 and show you the word sin is a noun in the entire chapter except for one place as a verb, sinning. That simply means that the entire chapter except for one verse in Romans chapter 6, you know, where it says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? 
And most people have defined it as, shall we continue sinning so that grace may abound? That's not what he's talking about. That sin is a noun. It's talking about the old man, the sinful man. And he says, shall we continue in the old man or the sinful man that grace may abound? You remember how Paul answered that? How can we? How can that happen? The sinful man has been has passed away. I've got the new creation. So how can I continue in the sinful man when he's passed away? God forbid. It makes a whole lot more sense than you thinking that's a verb. And he's saying, how can we continue sinning that grace may abound? God forbid you sinning. So every time you miss the mark in your area, which you're going to continue to miss the mark in your area until you see Jesus Christ, and then bam, he's going to complete the work just like he promised. I don't even understand. I can't wait till we get to that. I, I, I can't understand what people have been dealing with. It's like, are you actually saying, you know, I have not missed the mark since I've been saved? Yes, that's what I'm saying. You a lie. <laughs> you a lie and a link and your breath stink. I'm sorry, Mama. Forgive me. <laughs> that, that's, see, because I'm thinking about the transforming of your attitudes and the transforming of just how you carry yourself and your behavior, your bad behavior, catching up with your identity. And, and even, even with all of that, you still may miss tomorrow. You remember know what the Bible says? He said, whatever's done out of faith is sin. That's everybody in here. To know to do good, but to do it not is sin. That's everybody in here. I'm sure there are times in your life it's like, know to do good, and then you argue with God. Well, Lord, I don't know if I should do it or not. Or maybe I want to do it or not. I don't feel like doing it right now. Well, I'm too much in my feels right now. Hey, come on, bro. And we've got to get these, we've got to get these scriptures right. We've got to get them correct so that the devil won't use the ignorance of the scripture or a lack of understanding to use it to condemn us even the more by using the Bible to, to condemn you the more. And so we understand that our valuing him it's huge. My relationship with him, it's huge. Talking to him, it's huge. I, I've got this habit now of, you know, since I, I've been recovering in my health, I got this habit of just walking and getting to talk to the, to the Lord, and I, and I lose time. And especially when Taffy and I do it together, we just, just lose time because it's like, you know, we really love God, man. She got to testify one day. She said, you know we're not supposed to be here. I said, how you say that? And she just started calling the road. She said, well, you know, what have happened if you'd have died in that car wreck 20-something years ago? I said, yeah. She said, well, what would have happened if, if you know, remember the, the plane wreck we had in, in London? I said, yeah, I remember that. Uh, you remember the cancer and the meningitis you had? Mm, yeah. I, 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 said, I see what you're saying. She said, we ought to always praise God for life. We ought to always praise God for life. We ought to always thank God for life. I said, I, I, I see you're supposed to preach, Rep. <laughs> Next thing you know, we don't walk a couple of laps, a couple of miles. Yep. Where's your relationship with God? Man, I love him so much. When you have this relationship with God and you start loving God like this, you, don't, you, ain't, got, you ain't really got time for trash and drama and, and, and immature garbage. You start hearing that, you're like, no, I don't hear that. You ain't up there like, who said what now? Oh, I want to know. I don't want to know. Keep that to yourself. My wife's been teaching me, and we've been teaching one another about building boundaries and respecting those boundaries and not going over those boundaries over to the trash yard. It's like somebody says, ah, ah, ah. We're a member of a new club. <laughs> the Mind Your Own Business Club. We want to hear all that. Yeah, but I'm telling you so you know. I want to know. Have a little talk with Jesus, and you can tell him all about your troubles. You need to leave me and Taffy alone. <laughs> I want to hear that garbage. Go, go, go somewhere and grow up. And I used to be like that, but it's so amazing. Once you start developing this relationship with God, God will start teaching you. Now, we don't do things in a rude way, and we do things in love, but we kind of make it pretty clear. Listen to it and say, ah, you need to let that go. And since we know people are going to do what they want to do, we say it one time. And then they keep talking about it. We're like, Psh, uh, call me when you got all that out of you. And uh, we can keep on talking about something that's going to benefit you because your mind focused on something and all it's going to do is hurt you. 
So you need to hurry up and get your mind off of the trash. See, I think I said on the confession one time this, this past week, if you got confession, conf if you got garbage on the outside going through your ear, then you're going to put garbage on the inside, and then that garbage is going to come out of your mouth, and then you're going to be living in garbage. Because you got to be a good custodian of what you let in. It's the stuff on the inside of you that messes with you, not the stuff on the outside. All oh, the world going crazy, all oh, this and all that. That's on the outside. Your job is don't let all that in there. That's too much. Don't let all that in there. And that means you don't need to have to look at the news every day so you can see what's going on. The Holy Ghost will tell you what's going on. Some of y'all need to divorce yourself for a minute from that. I ain't saying it's a sin to look at the news, but don't become a slave to it. Just for, it's, your, it's your hour of garbage. <laughs> I, I don't want y'all that. Well, you need to know what's going on in the world. I know what's going on in the world. There's different ways you can get it without having to sit in there and get the garbage the whole time. I know who to pray for, what, de what devils to bind, and all that other kind of stuff. This is going to be an amazing time for the people of grace. I tell you, it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful time. Let me say this, and, and I'm going to close because I'm, I'm running out of time. I am convinced, I think Zechariah convinced me, Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10, I believe. He says that in the household of David, God shall pour out grace and supplication in the household of David. In fact, they pulled it up for me. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for the firstborn. One of the things I do know that's going to happen in the end times, that God is going to pour out his spirit of grace on people who operate by the law. And unsaved Jewish people are going to come to know him. And God says, I'm going to supply for them even though I was crucified by my own nation. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, well, excuse me, even though I was not accepted by my own nation because it was the Romans who, who re really did all of that. But anyway, hey. Grace is about to be poured out. And Sunday, I'm going to show you that grace is not going to end. Grace is going to be working for you throughout the ages to come for eternity. It's going to be grace that causes you to be raised from the dead. It's going to be grace that's caused you to put off mortal and put on immortality. It's going to be grace that's responsible for you being raptured up. It's going to be grace that's responsible for you to put on that new glorified body. And just when you think that you are, are, are responsible for anything, it's grace that's going to be the reason why you're in heaven. It is not going to be because of what you did, but because of the grace of God, that through grace, all of these things are still working for you even in the ages to come. You get anything out of it tonight? Yeah. Praise God. Through him. Through him. Father, we give you praise. We honor you. We ask in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you will do some magnificent things in the lives of these, your precious people. Thank you, Lord, that we're encouraged. We're stirred up. We're learning about you and this marvelous, marvelous grace of Jesus Christ. Bless your people today is my prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen. amen. Listen, if you just prayed uh, with us and you were here and you heard this, you're not born again, you want to get saved and you're streaming in from home or you may be here in the chapel this morning or tonight, uh, just repeat this prayer after me. I want to lead you to the throne of God. You ready? Heavenly Father, I realize that I'm a sinner, but right now I repent of all my sins. I make you my Lord and Savior. I receive the free gift of your forgiveness. Lord Jesus, I believe in you. Be my Lord, be my Savior. I accept you now in Jesus' name. And by faith, I declare 
that I'm saved. Amen. Amen. You prayed that prayer with me? Absolutely. Welcome to the family of God. Now, if you'll text the keyword, I'm saved, that's one word to 51555 and provide your name and email address. We're going to send you a free ebook so it'll help you out in your start with Christ today. Amen. Praise God. Well, let's worship God with our final act here today. Worship Him through the giving of our gifts. Worship Him through the giving of our gifts. Uh, if it's just one series in this year-long teaching on grace that I'm really excited about, uh, it's the series on, on how to worship God and getting the dollar sign out of your head and getting that love in front of you and that appreciation and honor in front of you where you will see that I am honoring God for what he has done. I am not coming before him in this moment saying, Lord, do this, do this, do this. I'm taking a moment out of my life and saying, Lord, thank you for this, this, this. And I bring a gift so that I can worship you in the beauty of your holiness. That's what this is about. And so as you give tonight and you're home giving, wherever you may be, keep that in mind that you're doing this to worship God and to honor him. And um, that's going to be an awesome thing. So I love teaching you guys on Wednesday night. It's a pretty awesome thing. Uh, the only thing that just trips me out sometimes is trying to figure out what to wear on Wednesday night so I don't have to wear a suit. So God bless you. Constance, you going to come on and finish it up for me? God bless y'all. Love you, babe. Glad about that word we got today. Aren't you glad that you get to have a relationship with God, right? You get to. We get to worship Him with our offerings. We get to engage and be obedient to His word. We don't have to. We get to. And in that relationship, we get to build and we get to benefit off of that. Uh, there's one thing I just want to testify. Um, because my relationship with God is really, really, it's serious, okay? To the point where, and my husband knows this, Every time I, the Lord knows I don't like to walk like that, you know, so anytime I go to the store anywhere, me and God got this connection. See, he loved me so much. I'm like, Lord, wherever I park, just make sure I don't go anywhere further than like maybe 15, 20 feet from the entrance. So every time, y'all, I, I kid you not, I got parking grace. And that's because the Lord, me and him, we like this. See, that's just one of the benefits. That's just, that's just me and his. You can get yours when you connect with God in your own way. All right? <laughs> anyway, you guys can stand up. Let's be dismissed. I pray that this... Oh, 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 oh. Okay, come on. Yes. Come on, people of God that get to... Get to give. Let's go. Okay. So if you have your offering, for those of you who, if you're online... You know your options. You can give by text. You can also call and you can mail that offering in or you can also go onto the web. So if you want to give by text, you can text your amount uh, to 74483 and then you can also call 866-477-7683 if you want to. You can also get that address and check the website. But for those of you who are here, uh, we're going to pray over the offering and then the uh, ushers will be able to minister to you. So, Father God, we thank you, Lord, for every person that is in this building and every person that is online. Lord God, we thank you, Lord, that we get to give. We count it an honor and a privilege that as we build this relationship with you, Lord God, we get to honor and worship you with our giving, Father God. And we do it because we love you, Father. And we do it because we want to honor you, Lord God. And as a result, just as a benefit, because you love us so much, you make sure that everything concerning us and everyone connected to us is blessed. And we thank you for that, Lord God. So for every seed that is sown tonight, Lord God, we declare a hundredfold harvest, Father. We thank you, Lord, that needs are met, Father God. There is no lack in any area of our lives, Lord God. In Jesus' name, we declare that and we believe it. It is so in Jesus' name. Amen. Ushers, if you would, go ahead and collect those offerings. For those of you who are watching live, you guys can... Um, follow those instructions. And now we are going to go ahead and be dismissed. I'm going to pray a blessing over you, Father God, for every, 
every individual that heard this word today, Lord God, we thank you, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will continue to minister this message, Father God. Help us to understand the difference between obeying you out of demand and obeying you out of desire, Lord God. We thank you, Lord, that we choose to, we desire to live a life of grace, Father, because we love you so much, Father, and not out of any type of control, Lord God. So we thank you, Lord, that this word resonates, Father, and that we will continue to understand you even the more in Jesus' name. Repeat this after me. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Oh God, my strength and my redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys are dismissed. You guys be safe. Love you. You asked and we answered. We know there are friends of the ministry who prefer CDs and DVDs. But for those of you who find the digital versions of messages better fit your life, Creflo and Taffy Dollar's message series are now available as digital downloads in the CYWE store. Log on to CYWEstore.com today to see the whole catalog of new and re-release messages that can be downloaded to any device for easy and convenient listening.